Hi, everyone. Uh, like Holly said, I'm Brian Sebez, and uh, I'll start by introducing Richard Burkett. Um, Richard Burkett uh, sort of re represents what uh, I think the potential of this can be across all members of the community. So Richard Burkett has a long history in working in clay. He started with a pottery in Indiana, Wild Rose, in the 70s, yeah. um, which then transitioned into a number of things, uh, including graduate school at Indiana University. Um, and Richard has been a tinkerer and inventor for a long time. You may know him for his work uh, in the 90s doing some um, 3D digital modeling with, uh, with some very early software, but also having written Hyperglaze, the glaze calculation software which is you know, one way to sort of get a key into the mind of Richard. Um, and I'm really humbled to be in the presence of some of these, yeah. some of these great minds. <laughs> well, you only, you only want to get so far into the mind, right? Uh, wait for the output of the mind. Um, but Richard was my graduate mentor in San Diego State. And when I, when I arrived there, it was a moment of transition for me and, a, and a, a sort of wealth of possibility, which was facilitated by Richard by some new digital fabrication tools that the art department had gotten and uh, a lot of support and latitude. Um, and I, I owe a lot to Richard. I'm very honored to be working with him. And, um, and we're going to do some demos today. And this is Richard Burkett. Thank you. OK. So I'm actually more honored to be working with Brian because as one of probably my favorite and best students, and I know some of you out here have been my students, so uh, you're still my favorites too. But. He's uh, got a brilliant and interesting mind that takes me back to one of those things in his comment that years ago, without taking a lot of time, I had some woman come in and she asked me if I ever made anything a little different in a Madonna. And I thought, if only I had a TV screen you could plug into her brain, and then I thought, no. <laughs> but Brian has the kind of mind that can really synthesize lots of things. And he, um, we invited him out to San Diego State to build one of these machines. I think it was your first workshop it building was, one. Yeah. And it was a complete success from day one. The students were excited. So um, Brian um, went to Humboldt State, somehow managed to make it out of the fog, and yeah. came down to San Diego. And uh, <laughs> code words. Um, <laughs> But he's now at SUNY New Paltz as a, a professor there, assistant professor, working his way up the ladder and te doing, building more of these than I can believe. I don't know how he gets any time done in the studio or teaching, but he's a, a brilliant guy and I'm really happy that he's here. So thank you. Thank you. Take it, Brian. Thank you. All right. So uh, we're going to start with See, Andy's getting mic'd up. Yeah. Um, yeah, how are we starting this? Did well, I'll tell you what I was planning on doing. Okay. I'm mostly going to do software to people's disappointment, probably. <laughs> but it's to also to prove a point. Like, it's a huge part of what this is about, really, is unfortunately, you know, if you're doing it yourself, if you're not doing it just by yourself, then, uh, then you might not have to do work so much on the sort of front end. But I'm going to do that. And I, the software I'm going to show is the software I showed earlier called Grasshopper. And um, I don't expect you to follow along, <laughs> really. This is like somewhere. It's not performance art because, you know, this, that, I don't think I could pull that off so much. But I, it's somewhere else. It's not a tutorial either. And then towards the end, what, what I'll do is I'll make something physical from what I did earlier. But that's towards the end. Great. And so I'll probably be working kind of quietly over here. People can ask me questions. I may feel the need to explain something along the way. But other than that, like, Great. it could be casual. So that's perfect, actually, because as a compliment to that, uh, Richard and I won't talk much about software at all. We'll, we'll be on the other side trying to keep the, the digital component um, sort of on the sidelines and in the background and talk a little bit more about the output. Uh, well, and it'll be great balance while Andy's doing that. And then maybe we'll do some flip-flopping as time goes yeah, on. Yeah, we planned it that way. Um, yeah, like Andy said, the, the digital world has an unbelievable amount of potential, but it also has, um, it's like infinite space, right, which we all know. So um, we'll work on 
on clay output. What's really great about this pairing is that we're, we both have clay as our output, uh, which is not necessarily always the case with digital tools, and I think that that's a difficult entry point for a lot of people. Um, Andy's going to be cutting clay slabs, and we're going to be 3D printing uh, with an extrusion-based 3D printer that prints wet clay. Um, and maybe just uh, in order to get ourselves tooled up, I'll talk about our clay a little bit, and then um, we'll do a little clay prep while we have, actually we'll start some machines printing, and then we'll do a little clay prep. Um, I like this, I can lean on this table. You can. Um, so the clay that we use uh, is really just a smooth clay because we're extruding out of a small nozzle and something with a lot of, uh, a lot of filler can get in the way of that and it can, um, it can wear the, the 3D printer parts out, mostly the canisters. Um, but really any smooth clay is usable with these machines. And in order to keep it simple, you could go down the road of, of deflocculation and then reflocculation and a stick-up slip scenario and all kinds of crazy stuff. But um, the, the way you know, we, we kind of hope to, to get people as in, interested in an in easy entry point is to just use clay the way it comes out of the bag, soften it a little bit. So it's kind of between, uh, between wedgeable and brushable. So it's like a paste. Um, it's kind of like when, when you get started on the potter's wheel and you throw and you make this hot mess and then you, you make a little rainbow on the wedging table. It's kind of like that clay. It's that, that soft. So it's not quite wedgeable, but it's still clay. And when it comes out of the machine, it dries pretty quickly because the surface area is pretty great. Uh, and then when it comes off the machine after the print, it's just the same clay that you're using for every other part of the process, which is great. And I'm hoping at some point later today, because we're both working in clay, something will happen between what we're, what we're both doing over here and with Andy. Um, I'm going to give a presentation uh, later today at 4 o'clock, and I'll talk a little bit more about the history of how we got to these machines. But um, I'll just, maybe I'll call out a few. I just want to get like, some, some thank yous out of the way. I was actually really ha happy to hear Liz Lehrman um, talk about the ceramics community and how we spent the entire beginning part of, of uh, the opening ceremonies thanking each other. Um, so I actually have some. Some um, thanking to do, I think, slightly outside of the Inseca community to the global community. Firstly, um, uh, there's, a, there's a history of the, the use of these desktop-based 3D printers working in clay that, it, that way predates what I do. Um, but the use of RepRap-based um, DIY desktop 3D printers uh, and, and adapting them for clay really started in earnest with Dries Verbruggen, who is a Belgian designer, and he has a design group called Unfold. And, um, and in the, I guess in the mid-aughts, the mid to late aughts, he was, uh, he was adapting small syringes to original Rapman 3D printers. And he did an unbelievable amount of work to get this kind of, uh, what is sort of a simple, but then becoming complex technology to, to work with extrusion printers. Um, and then, from that, uh, there's a gentleman in the UK named Jonathan Keep who is responsible for really ushering in the build it, like DIY, do it yourself uh, from a set of plans from the internet version of this Delta configuration printer. And um, he, he actually had the ethic, uh, which was that he, he wanted people to be able to build these things even with like normal woodworking and workshop tools. So his designs actually included um, MDF components, and, uh, and he, he was actually the, the, the first one to, to use a lot of zip ties to hold these things together, um, which I love, zip ties. So I took that design and adapted it, sort of scaled it up and adapted it to uh, materials and tools that you can easily get in the United States, um, and re-engineered a few of the components for some of the interests that I had in, in the process. Uh, including some things that are kind of on the horizon, which I'll talk about later. Um, so this design is something that is the product of a, a huge community. And I, you know, I, I actually don't think of myself as an inventor. I think of myself as a tinkerer. And this is the result of my tinkering with all of the work that everyone has done before me. And, uh, and so I owe a lot of debt to, to all that. Um, so Richard, I think maybe we should just get something started printing, and then we'll work on clay. Sure, because, you know, it's like watching paint dry, <laughs> watching kind, these things is, go. Yeah. But um, feel free at some point if you want to come up and watch these things run. If you haven't, um, it's sort of an interesting dance, just watching the little machine draw things. Um, are we ready? Uh, yeah, did you, you loaded something new on here, I did. Right? Okay. Seems like it's about 
Ready to run. You okay. got a tip for these? They uh, yeah, they're in there. Andy, how's Grasshopper? It's good, yeah. <laughs> I think at some point that my computer will be visible <coughs> on the screen. And then it'll be a little more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> at least if you're watching what I'm doing, I think. Why don't you describe what you're yeah. looking at right now? Yeah. So okay, just before, before Andy starts, you know, these things use uh, blunt tipped uh, lower lock needles, just like you probably have in your little slip trailer bottles. And they're really inexpensive. They're easy to use. They do clog up like crazy. So the bent paper clip, everybody's fa favorite computer tool, comes in handy again. And keeping them wet. This is a dance, uh, and it kind of is. So the, the way the, the plastic extrusion-based desktop 3D printers work is uh, the software controls both the movement of the machine and the rate of the feed of the material. And all that is sort of calibrated, um, and it happens kind of at once while the, while the material is coming out. So once you have the things tuned, of course it's not this simple, but it, it can be this simple. Once you have the machines tuned, you just push the button and then you go have a coffee. Um, with these printers uh, right now, the way we're, we're sort of keeping some of the process simple is the extrusion is controlled by pneumatic pressure, and that is actually independent from the, the mechanical um, and digital uh, movement of the machine, which in many ways is a little infuriating, but it's also really pretty brilliant because um, the rate of the feed of the material is something that you can control. So you can deposit more material or less material, uh, and you can kind of fine tune it while it's happening. So there's actually a, a kind of handedness that comes uh, both in how you can physically manipulate that you can actually mess with it because it's clay while it's printing. But also you can, you can be in control of how the material is coming out and essentially then the effect of what the, what the object looks like as it's happening, which is really nice. And you can change it. Um, actually, sometimes it's... Um, um, I went and did a workshop at the University of Akron with um, Eva Kwong, and she described it as a t uh, the machine as a toddler, which is uh, sometimes sort of while you're watching, everything's fine, and then you look away for five minutes, and there's crayon all over the wall. And it, it is kind of like that. The machines can be like that. So they do require some attention. And it's a little bit of a dance, and it's a balance. So um, Rich is going to get this thing started, and um, what he's doing... Oh, I'll probably lift this up. Yeah, it is. Didn't know you had it that deep. I'll fix that. Um, there's, um, there's an adjustability to the, to, the, to the point at which the machine starts printing. Um, normally when you're working with a MakerBot, you're using like a post-it note and you're doing the sort of slide test to make sure it's calibrated exactly with the bed. But with this machine, um, you can do that, but you can also adjust it. So you can move the cartridge up and down and therefore you can start to print wherever you want in terms of its relationship to the bed. Um, and that means that you can print on top of something. Uh, you can print directly on a bat or on plaster uh, or on plastic or paper, but you can also print uh, on top of a slab. Um, you can get the machine, like with the plastic printers, you can have the machine print a flat bottom to something, right? But I can think of like 15 faster ways to make a slab out of clay, and I'm sure you all can, than have the machine do it line by line like this. So what Richard's doing is he pr he's printing on a slab that we rolled out with a rolling pin, and um, so that saves some time. I apologize for the noise, um, but it runs on air pressure, so hopefully it won't be too leaky. And that, is that is that disturbing, everybody? Can you hear me? Can you hear me talking? Okay. It'll be over soon. <laughs> oh, it's looking good. Looking good. So he's adjusting the rate of the feed of the material, um, and also something that these machines do. Um, the, the digital controller there has a, has a dial on it, a knob on it. And something that you don't do with the plastic printers is it has a percentage feed rate on it. So while it's printing, you can turn the little dial. to sort of, It's sort of like, um, like, a, like the way you would work with a turntable. Um, you can actually speed it up or slow it down, the percentage feed of the machine. So you can make it move really slowly. Uh, and it, when you do that, it actually then uh, effectively increases the flow rate of the material without having to change the pressure, if that makes sense. So you can balance those two things while it's printing in order to get it like what you want. 
And then, um, and then while it's printing, you can let it print, or you can mess with it, and then check back to make sure it's doing, doing what it's supposed to be doing. Just add a little air bubble. Looks like it's working. It's great. Okay. Well, you can see it very. It's very small over somebody's head there. In the <laughs> Uh, I drew the model. Brian built this at a workshop for Kansas State. Yeah, I think it's a good opportunity. So now that this thing's printing, um, it's a good opportunity to talk about where these, where these machines come from. Um, I, I guess I talked about the source of the design. And uh, like Richard said, the one on the right here that he started printing on was built uh, as a workshop at Kansas State. Who's, where are the K-State people here? Yeah, identify yourselves. Um, so... Uh, it w wasn't just me. Uh, the, the, way I, the way these workshops have been going is um, I have provided the digital files for the, the wood components, the digital files for the 3D printed plastic parts, which are the parts that build the machine, uh, and then a parts list. And uh, whoever the local coordinator is purchases all the parts. And then when I'm there, we build it as a workshop. So the students are involved, the other faculty are involved, putting the thing together. And that actually helps to democratize the, the, you know, the construction of the machine and get people invested in a really kind of meaningful way. Uh, and then we start talking about modeling and printing. Um, and then everybody's invested, which is great. Uh, to the point where, um, you know, Amy Santa Ferrero names the machine. Those of you in the room might appreciate this. So you can see there's the little plastic palm trees there. And this machine is called Thixotropics. Get it? <laughs> yeah, that's Amy. Is Amy here? Where's Amy? Darn it, Amy. Um, so, so that machine was built as a workshop at, at K-State. <laughs> but additionally, uh, because uh, this, is, this is built on the, um, open plans, open source, shared resources, um, the, the kind of refolding that I did with the design was taken by someone else in the audience, Jessica Brandle. Um, Jessica Brandle built the machine on the left, and uh, that is actually a kind of a conflation of the design, um, the scale, and the redesign that, that I provided, and her work with, um, with Kevin, it's not Heinz, Hins, with Kevin Hins, who is in the... Uh, in the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. So when she was a resident at, uh, at Harvard Ceramics, she worked with Kevin and the Graduate School of Design uh, and built one of these machines from uh, a combination of those parts, the work that Kevin was doing and the work that Jonathan Keep has done. Um, and she's been using it with another um, uh, extrusion based, like um, uh, paste ceramic extrusion based uh, ad adaptation, which is from a group in Italy called WASP, um, and they put together, I guess, well, I have an example of something that I'm re-engineering, re but um, this is a, a mechanism based on the WASP design, which is uh, a screw feed that is fed with pneumatic pressure to fill this little chamber. And then once the chamber is filled, this little screw turns and it pushes the clay out and feeds it. So rather than having the flow rate determined exclusively by the pneumatic pressure of the, of the compressor, um, it's actually metered out through the screw feed, which allows it to start and stop. Um, and so Jessica has been working with a version of that from the group in Italy called WASP. Um, and because everything is based on the same open source RepRap 3D printer design, it's something that you can just bolt to the head, hook up to the board, do some calibration, and get printing. Um, and she's been printing a number of things uh, from resources that are, that are more relative to, to her research, which are things like um, the, the open source availability of things like um, what Duke University puts together. What is the name of the? Morphosource. Morphosource, where you can download um, you, I'm sure you all know that, the, that uh, everyone in anthropology has been 3D scanning things for a really long time, right? They go to excavation sites and they capture an unbelievable amount of data, including things like uh, reproductions of, this is the lady. Homo ergastus. Homo, homo ergastus. So you can download, like, you know, old hominids and 3D print them. Um, Richard, how's, how's the print going? Um, I think the slip's a little erratic. Erratic it's, slip. It's stopping and starting, and I haven't okay. adjusted the pressure a little bit. Not as smooth as it should be. Well, that's the way it goes. 
Um, I actually sort of like defects and things. I've done that a lot with clay extrusions, just with a hand extruder and power extruders and things like that. The idea of little pop-outs where the air bubbles were there as just interesting defects that sort of humanize or naturalize something that is otherwise really mechanical. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I've done that to a certain extent in, in, in my, I guess, my most recent work. Um, but maybe before, before we get to talking more about that, I, I guess I'm going to talk about some clay preparation. So, or maybe just do some clay preparation. I don't really need to talk that much. <clears throat> okay, I'll kind of jump in a little bit here. So, um, if, if my screen could be up there. Has my screen been up there? No. Okay. A little bit. If you could keep it up. That would be good. So, over at least on this side. If, but if you have to split, that's fine. I understand. People understand. So what we have here is um, this is an example of, of what I showed a little earlier for some people who are here for that. Um, it's instead of a quadraxial blend, this is something else. This is uh, represents sort of colorants additions for this machine that would be digitally controlled. And so um, since it can. You know, I mean, the scenario is is it can mix glazes sort of without a lot of labor, and um, so the number of glaze tests it's not as big of a factor as if you're doing it manually. So then the issue is sort of how do you create a lot of recipes that might be relevant, that would be worth your time and worth the material, <clears throat> and and how do you visualize that, right? And so that's what this sort of is doing here is. Basically, each you know each letter represents um, one of these colorants, uh, and the way it works is it takes each triangle, it takes the center of that, it then measures the distance to all the corners, and that's what creates the blend, right? So depending on what shape you have, you get a sort of a, you know something that might have a lot of one ingredient and very teeny tiny percentages of say an ingredient like cobalt or something like that. And so for the workflow to work sort of successfully, it has to go from that visual representation then to sort of a text file. And so this software is, um, will then stream this recipe to a text file. And so what we have here is each sort of recipe, you know, with the ingredients uh, ready to go. And this is, this is tailored to, to go to the machine that I've made for this, right? So that it just would read the text file would poop out those ingredients in those percentages. And the way it works is it's, it's sort of a liquid system. Um, it's based on time. So it calibrates itself initially. It would say, like, squirt out a liquid that is, let's say it's a glaze that has a high percentage of uh, cobalt in it. It opens up a solenoid for so many milliseconds and it does that onto a scale. The scale then sends the information back to the software, tells it how much that weighed. It does a calibration sort of process. And then it knows how many milliseconds open equals how many you know, grams dry, basically. So then this gets translated. And so it's a ton of sort of labor initially to make the tool. But then the point is, is once the tool is made, so that, that labor doesn't have to be done over and over and over again. And why I'm showing you this is not because you're going to want to go make this or you're going to use this, but it's really kind of like these digital tools do sort of spread out in sort of unexpected ways. Like when I started working with Rhino, I didn't think I was going to be making sort of a glaze mixing device with it, but it just se it seemed sort of possible where I hadn't even thought that was something that, that I would do or be able to kind of sort of do. So um, I'm going to prepare a little clay over here, way in the corner. 
Um, but I, I just took a bag of like standard pug clay and um, the, the same way you might uh, refresh a bag that's been sitting around too long and it dries out, I lanced it with some holes and then soaked it in the, um, in the hotel bathtub uh, in the trash can <laughs> a couple nights ago. And so it softened the clay and got it to this kind of paste consistency. Uh, but I want it just a little bit softer. So you can see it's like, you know, it's sticky. It's not quite plastic. It's sticking to my, to my hands. But it is just clay with a little extra water. It's something like 45%, maybe 50% water content at the most. Um, so I, um, I'm going to do this kind of the brute force style by just spraying with water and mixing it together. Uh, and then I'm going to kind of wedge it with a spatula and pack into the tube. And it's really just as simple as that. Um, there are a lot of ways to, to potentially automate this process. But um, where do you want to turn that up a little bit? So right, so the, the toddler is uh, drawing on the wall right now. Actually, not quite. It's, it's just the flow is, uh, is down yeah, a little bit. So Richard's adjusting it. Um, what was I talking about? Automating this. Yeah. Pug mills. Right, yeah. So pug mills. You know, it's funny that the um, clay has this, uh, has internal shear in it, which is like part of, part of what makes it such a magical material. Like it holds itself together in a really particular way. And the more water you add to that, the more you disrupt it, right? It loses its plasticity past a point. Um, and pug mills actually depend on that to a certain extent. Right, like so. If it's if the clay is really really soft, it doesn't really it doesn't really pug the same way. Um, so, and because I've kind of been working on a on a relatively small scale, it's easier to just do this rather than to like load up a pug mill with with a huge amount. Um, also, I don't have a pug mill, so. Huh? Yeah, a kitchen aid. So. so, in case you're wondering, one of my first questions to Brian when he brought, built the machine for us is could, you know, would you want to deflocculate the clay a little bit? And so one of the big issues there is as soon as you deflocculate clay, it loses a lot of its plastic strength. And this really depends on that slight rigidity and fixotropy of the clay to, for the model not to just collapse under its own weight. So uh, you do actually he heat that sometimes, right, with a heat gun if you're doing a complex form. I do. A little drying as it's being built sometimes can help out. Uh, but deflocculation really is sort of counterintuitive to what we're trying to do here. Yeah, I was actually talking to, um, to Stuart Urim, who is um, who's a ceramic engineer um, and production genius, who is actually the person responsible for inventing the, are the Shapeways people here? Am I allowed to say this? Anyway, um, I guess I'm gonna say it. Who is responsible for, for inventing the new uh, porcelain process that Shapeways is using, which is this really brilliant thing, and I think the samples that they have here are, are this process. Um, and Stu, um, uh, we were talking about this deflocculation thing, and. I think the, you know, the biggest issue with the clay is that it's got a little extra water in it. So the problem is evaporation of water. If you want the thing to hold itself together, you still have to evaporate the water, right? So even if you deflocculate it, um, besides all the other things that Richard was talking about, you still have to evaporate the water from it to get it to kind of hold its shape to a certain extent. So um, keeping it simple is just helpful. And the, you know, the heat gun is, um, I have melted some of those plastic uh, effector centers on the printer uh, in moments of desperate. I always refer to the heat gun as the desperation tool, so. I do, yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, maybe just a minute. So Brian says in his slideshow this afternoon, he actually has some photos of um, a late colleague of mine from uh, Indiana, David Harold, who invented this wonderful clay extruder that was totally mechanical. He had a, a paint caulking gun and saw blades that, you know, they have those little teeth for the ratchet to increment the form as it turned. And I think a hair dryer going on it to dry. And it's probably the first slip printer that I ever remember. And Brian will show you some pictures of it. He did amazing work with it. It was totally mechanical. 
and he was just had the kind of mind. I wish he was here today because I know he'd be enjoying all these things, but sadly, he's no longer with us. So. Yeah, I love that. I love that printer. Um, I it's know um, all I know. plywood. What's that? All plywood. All plywood. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell this joke later. But uh, but I, I often look at that thing and imagine that it could have come out of like Williamsburg or Brooklyn in the last year, right, with a fancy YouTube video, putting the soul back in three D printing. You know. <laughs> So I guess I just started doing this thing that maybe I should explain, which is um, the cartridges, and with most clay processes, you, you want to de-air the material and kind of compress it as best you can. Um, and for, for this extrusion process, that's as much because the entire contents are under pressure, and when that pressure works its way out to the nozzle, it makes this little burst, uh, which is sometimes sometimes nice, but it's not necessarily beneficial, and you probably want to be in control of that. So um, if you can kind of see what I'm doing here, oh, I'm just out of view, which is great. Um, I'm, I'm taking the clay, and I'm just I'm kind of scraping it the same way you would work with, a, with one of these if you're mudding a wall, doing some, some uh, drywall patching. And I'm just uh, scraping it against the, against the spatula in order to burst or remove any air pockets. That's really it. Because I did put a little bit of air in it while I was um, kneading it. And this also is a way to kind of um, uh, homogenize it because I did add a little extra water to it. So I'm just kind of scraping it over the surface to get the air out of it um, and making a big pile which then I will use to pack the tube. Again, if you look at this piece um, on the postcard, if you want to come up and take a look, this is what happens when you have air in the clay. <laughs> and I was a little much of, bit much of a hurry one day, but I sort of like that as a defect. So. It was just sort of blowing out little bits of, um, you know, pops of clay and, and blowing holes in the model because when you get an air pocket, it blows air through the nozzle really quickly at fairly high pressure. I really like that Richard can tell you that the image that he has on his postcard is a failure. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> but right, like a brilliant failure. It's like. I think we got a lot of variation in, in consistency on that because the layers are really erratic. Right. Yeah, I guess that happens. Texture. Texture. So I've, I've been told that, that uh, my computer will kind of stay up there in a little bit here, I think. I was working away, and I thought you could see what I was doing for a while. And then I kind of looked up and like, oh, OK, there we go. OK, so what, what I'm building here is just uh, this is going to be a, a shape I'm going to cut out and sort of fold up in, in wet clay. And um, so there are different ways to sort of control the shape at this point, to sort of move it around. And so this is just a 2D vector-based line. So it's um, the white line is the one I'm sort of looking at. And then over here, we have, like, this is the sort of this is an algorithm, essentially, which is really just a set of instructions, really just telling it there's different steps to go through. And um, at the, like a lot of software, you know, a lot of the tools are sort of located up at the top or to the side. And the thing that's interesting about um, Grasshopper, besides the fact that it's a visual programming language, which some people don't even know those exist, and the reason you might not know that is because there aren't that many. Uh, the sort of early ones really go back to sort of early days of monitors and computers. Uh, and then they were sort of abandoned for the most part. And um, people who work with sound started working with them and some sort of live video projection. And so there's some, there's some software that sort of predates this that really led to this, you know. And just like ceramics, you know, most of what's done is really built on what happened before uh, by other people. And that's definitely true in this community of um, Grasshopper. And so it's a really active uh, community where people, people work together on things and help each other sort of solve problems. So it's, it would not be uncommon for, for me to sort of 
be hit a wall in terms of what I'm trying to do, and I would post something on a form and someone in Iran would answer it, a mathematician who teaches at a university or something, and help me figure out some part of it, right? That happens, you know, routinely. And so um, the sort of do-it-yourself ethic that is, you know, sort of had this resurgence, at least given a name, right, in the last decade or two, uh, there's kind of a, another version of that, which is DIT, do it together, and that's that's probably more sort of descriptive of the sort of process that a lot of this stuff is sort of developed and used. So, um, so one of the weird things with digital is it's not real yet, in the sense that I know what is real, right? I can't touch it. I can't really see it. I've just seen this representation of it. And ultimately, it's going to be a sort of clay slab, and I'll sort of fold those sort of um, fingers sort of up or something like that. And in this case, it would be, you know, I'm thinking of making sort of like a plate for the table, like a little centerpiece, right, that could hold something. And so the, the software is parametric, it's called. So you can sort of um, change different attributes on the fly, right? And so this is the way you, you can create sort of just this incredible number of um, objects that are related to each other that sort of come from the same logic but have slightly different inputs. And so it raises this question that, that people who are making pots sometimes um, are or should be faced with, which is when is there sort of, um, you know, a distinction but no real difference, right? And that's something that sort of studio potters really sort of deal with all the time. So I'm not saying that's necessarily a problem, but sometimes that is the case. Just because things are slightly, you know, you can make a distinction between them, there may not be much of a sort of a relevant sort of difference in them. And with this software, that's just really driven home when you can make, you know, 100,000 different variations of something, which is sort of ridiculous on some level. Um, but it also sort of holds out this sort of potential goal of doing production like that, right? So doing some production with tools and machines where each object is, in fact, as unique or um, there's a distinction between them. But I preface that with the problem, which is really how different are they? So we're going to, I'll make one or two of these things. Okay. So the first step for me is, you know, sort of do the drawing and then, um, and then I'll take that and I'll turn that into information that the machine can understand to do that. And what I'm showing you is not the easy way to do it. That, you know, I'm showing you how I do it. And it's ridiculous on some level and that's fine. That's kind of like what I want people to see is that it's not, um, this isn't software that a company wrote. I wrote it, uh, you know, this part of it, and I wrote it with the help of other people I've never met and will never meet, probably, and that it's sort of one sort of step to probably it will evolve into something sort of else as it goes along. And the guy that wrote Linux has a great quote, which is sort of, computer code is too important to be left up to coders. And I think that, that there's a lot of truth in that. And before I started working digitally in three dimensions, that was one of my real criticisms of it. Like, I didn't want to use software. It's like you just push a button, and then it's like this cool thing sort of happens, right? Like there's no, well, yeah, I guess we sort of have that in the ceramics community, maybe, you know, um, with different sort of, I don't know what would an example of that be, like some sparkle glaze that you buy, some commercial glaze that has speckles in it or something, right? Which many people in here would be like, oh my God, that's so horrible. Some people would be like, those are cool, I love them. But you know, that would be an example of something that's like preloaded by someone else, you know, and sort of figured out and then you just package it and just stick it on your thing. And the digital world is full of that stuff. Like, you know, these tools that really, is, I feel like often when you use them, you really just manifest sort of the creativity and brilliance of someone else. You know, you just sort of like making that physical. Um, obviously, people take those things and they break them and they do unexpected things <coughs> with them. And um, that can be interesting. You don't have to like 
be this involved in it to use these tools by any means. And the spectrum is, is as wide as it is in the ceramic community in terms of how people are using it. But, um, you know, this is the way I'm working, so. Okay, so probably what I'll do is the white line will be the cut line, and then I'm gonna do, just to show what this sort of tool can do, is I'll also sort of um, do a kind of like a Mishima. I won't fill it with color, but these lines here will be sort of engraved partially into the slab, not cutting all the way through. Uh, and maybe we'll do less of them or more of them, right? Okay. I hope nobody gets seasick. You know, I know it can be kind of like hard to watch this. Okay, so now, earlier I was talking about how stupid these machines are, so now I just have to, tell, I have to teach this thing sort of which direction the knife is pointing. And if, if, um, if I'm a little bit off, it has no idea. So it would be like someone cutting you know, a slab and holding the blade at a slight angle instead of the angle that would actually make the cut nicely. So I have to kind of go through this sort of slow process of of teaching it that. And so the way I'm going to do this is I have these metal blocks, right? And I'm just going to move it in one axis. Lower it down. I, I pull this up here. I did this earlier, but I didn't have anything taped down, so I borrowed some scotch tape, which is like, you know, probably not what I would do in my studio. It'd be fixed down a little better. So it could be, the whole thing could kind of move. We're going to use scotch tape to hold the slab down today. And so now these things are completely parallel to the table, right? So I know that. I know that um, if I go in the middle here, go down and I hold this sort of ruler across that will give me like I can turn this freely by hand and I'll move this down a little and then it does this annoying thing like I get it just right now I'm going to give it electricity and it's going to slightly move just a little bit, you know, so now I have to like tune it in. And I know this might be sort of painful to watch, but that's kind of the point. Like this stuff is not, like you don't just put print, you know? Like part of me would like that, obviously. Like I don't get a lot out of this part of the process anymore. I'm like, yeah, I should build a tool that does this for me, you know, and write the software to do it. But I, you know, like you guys, I want to make work that exists in the physical space. And so I just try and get there as quick as I can. And it's not always sort of smooth, but um, that's, the, that's the deal. OK. So these, these machines, all, almost all the machines probably in here, are made to work a certain way, which is maybe not obvious. Um, and it does separate it from like the way we as people work, which is, all the instructions are given to the machine, and then it starts, right? 
And you can't really, like accidents can happen, but typically like the motion, where you're telling it to go, that's, that's programmed in, right? There's a lot of interesting work being done by um, artists and you know, architects and sort of, um, people working with these tools that are dealing with sort of live situations, right, where you can change on the fly. But typically, things are sort of pre-programmed. They're front-loaded. And I would say that's a, that's a major limitation of the process, right? Like, everything has to be preloaded. You know, it's like solid wit drawings every day, all day with these machines. You have to tell it exactly what to do, and then it starts, right? And um, I've been building some tools to try and sort of break through that sort of what I think is a problem. Um, but today, we're going to just stick with like this. So. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay. Hey, even better. Thank you. That's a cool color. So, one last. So, is the blade set up as the A axis in the G code, or are you running that as a separate program? Yeah, it's the, it is the A axis, exactly. Okay. And so now what I'm doing is I'm just moving this A axis, which is this one, right? Um, there are commercial machines that are made to do this kind of thing, um, like to cut materials that a laser cutter would burn or something like that. But there, it's definitely like an area where not a lot of people have made machines. And for ceramic, you know, ceramic industry doesn't use this, the clay, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna warp too much, it's gonna shrink too much, it's gonna have all the problems that we deal with, or a hand builder would deal with, right? Um, okay, so. All right, so now what I'll do is I'm, I'll kind of go into a little bit, somebody asked, asked about the A axis and like creating instructions, so. That's what I'm going to do now, is kind of open up a, um, a definition for that. So this sort of mess is actually, it's, um, it's not up there anymore. It's over here. So this is really a collection of a lot of different tools, right? And so I'll kind of zoom in and sort of, this is a file naming thing, right? So if I'm gonna make a lot of something, so I, I've made like a, uh, a larger piece that was made up of a thousand different individual cutout things, so I had lots of different files to sort of cut. And so there's a lot of chance to make mistakes and you know just spend a bunch of time naming files. And so what this does is it, it names stuff for me. So this is the file name itself, right? And it's got today's date on there. And then if I do another one, it counts up one. I just hit this and the file name changes. Or I can change this and make, it's complex, really. You know, it's like organizing just this ton of information. And so some of the tools are built around that, dealing with the complexity of it. And I think it's a legitimate critique of a lot of this software is this grasshopper is sort of known as like a type of software you can use and make like complexity that's, I'm not foolish enough to say it rivals nature, but it sort of imitates it in a way that you might not think computer um, generated art would, right? So you can program in randomness, you can have things that are sort of not like 
they don't look like it came from a computer program. So things can gradate and blend in ways that you would maybe find in nature, right? And so that's really appealing to me as somebody looking at using these tools. But I don't want to, you know, typically where my work fails, it's either really tight, too tight, looks like the machine had too much impact on the thing, um, or it just fails, like for all the reasons that ceramics fails, right? Like it warps, it cracks, it, whatever, all that stuff I have to deal with, of course. Um, but I think one critique of this software is it's really good at making complex things. And that's, you know, that could be a, there's enough complexity in the world, right? <laughs> so I think it's a legitimate critique. Like, you know, we don't necessarily need more complex visual things in the world, um, especially when it comes to sort of like buildings and design spaces and things like that. But that's what this stuff is really good at doing. Okay, so that's that. Um, so now I'm gonna do the cut curve. Um, I'm gonna select these curves that I'm just gonna carve in just slightly into the slab. And I'm going to put them into this like container, basically set multiple curves. And so now it's like crunches all this information and what it gives me in the end is, uh, there you can see the little, that's the knife blade. This is a way for me to simulate and make sure that I haven't made a terrible, terrible mistake, which is, I've made many of those, so. So you can see what it's doing here. There's like so many places where things can go wrong, right? So this pink thing is the blade, and it's going, it's, there's a straight line here, and then what's it gonna do next? You know, is it just gonna turn that 90 degree angle in the slab? Like if we were cutting out the slab, we wouldn't do that. We'd lift up our hand and just gingerly like place it right where it needs to be. And we'd do that without even thinking like at all. I mean, it'd, just, it'd be so easy for us. For me to tell the computer to do that, just in those instances, I need to like program in this sort of logic and do all this sort of stuff, right? And when you're using, say, like a 3D printer, it's one of the reasons why those typically work the same way. Like of this technology to 3D printed stuff, tends to be um, sort of simpler on some level. It's the same strategy almost every time, layer by layer. You print one layer, you go to the next. You never go back down. You go up to the next layer, and it's the same sort of layer. It's stratigraphic, it can look beautiful. It's always gonna be the same strategy unless you're doing something really sort of weird and you're going in and changing something that in some cases you're not supposed to change, right? <laughs> um, Okay. So that's look, that looks good. We can just sort of, I'm gonna guess that this is right. So now what we're looking at is this is the actual um, G code itself. Somebody asked about like what um, the A axis, you know, and I could tell like you, you know, this is stuff you're working with as well. The interesting things here are, have to do with um, the feed rates. This is the thing that, I give that example of somebody in Iran who helped me, you know, with a math problem. They helped me with this uh, part of the problem that has to do with the speed that each axis has to move to be in the same place when you want it to be there. So it's called coordinated motion. All of the machines in here do that. And um, when you're working with three axes, it's relatively easy. When you add another axis that's um, rotating, so it's not traveling inches per minute, but it's traveling in radians or degrees, then it gets really weird and really complex, and you need somebody who is a mathematician maybe, or, or not, you know, to help you with that. And um, so these sort of, that was a stumbling block for a while for me, and then I finally got it, got it working. So if I can go back 
back to that uh, layer by layer thing that Andy was just talking about. Is my mic on? Great. So, um, yeah, that's the, that's the strategy for, for these kinds of 3D printers. And it actually reinforces something that we have been talking about a little bit. And that is the machines are not really that smart. They're, um, they're in many ways, the, these 3D printers in particular, are really just printing sheets of paper, like layer by layer by layer. It's only smart enough really to think about, and it's, and it's kind of an efficiency in the process, but it's really only just thinking about a two-dimensional shape. So it's building form by two-dimensional shapes, which is like something that we teach when we're teaching uh, being visually literate. Um, and the computers and the printers are just at that stage of understanding visual literacy. So, um, of course, like with the CNC machine in particular, you can, you can move dynamically, but 3D printers right now are, are um, still kind of resigned to the idea of just kind of printing layer by layer, and that's where resolution comes in, um, which is an interesting thing. And in fact, that's actually happening with what's printing right here, which is why I was talking about it. Um, this piece that, uh, that Richard designed uh, is a victim of a few things, which is doing something quite wonderful. Uh, it's a victim of um, uh, Brian's last trip to Harbor Freight. So the really cheap pneumatic tools are not necessarily a good idea. So they're really leaky. The, the, um, the pressure regulator is fluctuating, and it's actually doing this on its own, and it's a function, I think, of the internal mechanics of the pressure regulator and the compressor coming on and off, uh, which is not timed just to, to upstage Andy, I swear. <laughs> Um, but so it's fluctuating the pressure, which means that the layers, they're actually really, it's really defining a nice geologic kind of strata, like um, almost as if uh, some of the layers are more erosive than others. Um, so if you have a chance to come up and look at it, you can really see the difference in the way it's depositing. And it's making it really quite dynamic, which is, which is incredible. I'm sure Richard will, maybe he'll put it on his next card. To give you a sep uh, an example of like how, s how open that loop is that we want to have closed, like I didn't even size the thing. Like I was getting ready to print it because I'm like, man, this is taking too long, running out of time, I got to print it. This is not scale. I have no idea how big the thing was I was just making. Is, this is the biggest problem with digital tools. Is, there's, this feedback loop is stretched out. And so like if I were to have, you know, one basic wish in this area of research, I would say tools that close that loop. You know, when I look at the potter, I'm like, you know, somebody working on the wheel, it's like, man, you have that in spades, the ability to sort of just get information back live, react to what you see, change things, change the profile, and just having that back and forth is, is really like, you know, sometimes it's worth you know, champion some of the stuff that we have that a lot of, you know, other areas of research or art making don't have. And I think like for clay, that is the thing, like we talk about it, I guess, which is, is it's so direct, it's so tactile. And partially what we're saying is you can change it like right there, right then, you know. <laughs> <laughs>